Hello, my name is Adam Bean and welcome to 55th edition of Airhex TV. So let's start with the news first. Okay, um, I recorded a, um, the, the next episode of the Airhex.fm podcast with Bruno Borges. And Bruno is a, is a, a long time Java, Java and Java E developer. He was also at Oracle and now he's working on... Um, on uh, Microsoft Asia and tries to introduce or tries and introduces uh, Java and Java E to Microsoft Asia. It might be interesting. So this is the last episode and there are already several episodes in the pipeline. So stay tuned. So the next thing is um, I get already um, a lot of registrations for the uh, winter air hacks and uh, for the web as well as for the Java E part. So the web part, uh, one thing happened is um, I actually extended the agenda for the um, effective web apps. So what I plan to do is to implement a full app from scratch, just using web standards with web components, implementing routers, uh, CSS layout grid, uh, offline installation, offline caches, and whatever you need for an application and try to answer all the questions I got from the previous courses like web standards. And I try to minimize frameworks as much as possible. Okay, then, um, the um, really hot news is I published on September the 23rd the Effective Web Standards or Effective Web Apps with Web Standards workshop. It comprises, I think, around, uh, oh, around 90 sessions, it's not true, 82 and already three bonus episodes. And by the way, the bonus episodes are completely free. And what I do right now, I, um, I implemented one with uh, storage estimations, another one responsive layout with layout with media queries and the source for the app is on GitHub. So if you like, download this and this is as always, you can buy it uh, at once. Um, so you can download all the videos or uh, there is a one week uh, rent all period. So. Okay, done. Now, the next news is, uh, let's start with the topics. And the very first, uh, not questions, rather a question from my blog. And um, the first one is, what I did is, I published the uh, micro profile um, Maven Kickstarter with, um, uh, for micro profile 1.3. So for, for unknown reasons, the uh, first version disappears from Sonatype Central or I just released the uh, snapshot and forgot to release the release and then it disappears, I think, after two weeks. But now uh, a final release is deployed and it comes with liveness checks and this is a micro profile archetype. So what archetype is, is a kind of a wizard. Um, okay. And someone also asked, you know, uh, what about why I'm not managing uh, Docker with Maven? And the answer is, in my opinion, Maven is for building the war and net not managing the deployment pipeline. So what I usually use, I use uh, um, Jenkins for for uh, deploying the applications, running unit tests, integration tests, system tests, starting the environment. I just use Maven for, for builds. And I don't like, you know, what I really don't like is, for instance, the Maven site plugins, which generates even HTML. So I'm just waiting uh, for a project where they try to attempt, you know, to, to brew some coffee with Maven. <laughs> so um, this is the reason, a separation of concerns and need for speed. I would like to Maven to build the Java E application really fast. And then I have a multi-stage pipeline and each stage is fast, but the whole pipeline can takes, of course, longer because you know the whole system has to be built, uh, started, deployed, and so forth. Okay, then this was uh, don't close the provided input stream. This is actually interesting feedback I got. So um, I and this is an old post, three years old. So what I did, I passed input stream and uh, and I used and try with researches which closes the stream, and I got an interesting feedback feedback from Eric and it says um, if someone passes an input stream you shouldn't close it and the advice is actually brilliant because um, um, if you let's say you are using message body reader or message message body writer for um, in JaxRS um, you get all the output stream passed to you but you are, you are also not supposed to close it so I think this is a good advice in general if someone passes an input or output stream as a parameter to your me method don't close it. it it has to be closed outside the method this was a good one so um, 
so the next uh, so we got it so the next one is a little bit longer so yeah I implemented I, pre I, I compared stateful and session scoped so what's the difference between stateful and session scoped and I got an, an, an um, interesting question is the following um, Regarding your remark on session scoped EJBs, does this also apply to request scoped? And for which application servers have you observed this? Is this is this demanded by specification? So what I said is the the the, the difference between session scoped and and stateful is the stateful EJBs. If you do something stateful, there is one to one relation between the proxy and the stateful EJB and session scopes meet is bound to the HTTP session. And there is one exception from the rule, an EJB can be stateful and session scoped and therefore it is bound to the HTTP session. Um, and for which application is this is demanded by specification? Yes. Um, so if you are using request scoped EJB, this actually, in my opinion, doesn't make any sense because um, Request scoped EJB means the EJB should reappear and disappear for each request. And this is not what EJBs are supposed to do. So what EJBs are doing, they are, they are not scoped at all. And they are actually pooled. So the number of, of instances is dictated by number of threads. And so request, request scoped EJBs or request scoped stateless, I never tried that. And I don't think it makes any sense. Um, I hope I had I had no time, you know, to, to look up in specification. But for now, it doesn't make any sense to me. If you if you find a use case, just ping me, and we will cover this in the fifty six edition of EHX TV. Okay. Now, um, also an interesting remark, but this is already clarified. But I think it was interesting. So um, uh, Omar Alvarez, uh, then Pyle, asked me. Is there any way to externalize the calculation of a mathematics formula in a way that you can change it later? Um, of course, and I use Nashorn for that. And actually, I implemented a whole framework with that called Anhydrator. This is the framework. And what I did is um, I implemented like processing pipeline. And the what the pipeline does is implemented in Nashorn in JavaScript. And the implementation comes with an interface. And um, in my current project, we are implemented like, um, I would say, uh, commands uh, with JavaScript. And we also use JavaScript for validations. And the, the, the idea, or in one, one particular time, for content validation. And we were able to load the JavaScript code from a database. And we could change it on runtime. And uh, what what um, and uh, it run on a JVM, so this was not like you know Node.js interpreter. It was part of the JVM, and so it was as secure as Java is. Okay, so also covered. And the next question, regular question, twenty four day, uh, days ago, is the following: um, If you are involved, so J Juma Juma Rom ask me. If you are involved in a project in which you have to, to do a lot of CRUD, create, read, update, up to which point is acceptable to include the Delta Spake JPA module dependencies? So I would say, uh, first, what you can always do, you can just, the entity manager is able to do out of the box the CRUD. So you, what you only need is, are the queries. And um, I would say, if you introduce, you know, Delta Spike, or if you have the feeling with Delta Spike, you will you will save several days of work, or a few days, or let's see, at least a few hours, and your code looks clean and is understood by your colleagues. Go go for it. And the next question is for for how long the application is supposed to be maintained, and um, just because in in one point of time Delta Spike could disappear from the horizon. The question is what happens then. It is less likely than JPA will disappear. It is more likely than Delta Spike will disappear. It is unlikely, but more likely. So this is always, you know, everything is a likelihood in, in architecture. So this you should take consider this. Um, so and um, for me, I would just go with straight entity manager and then try with one control which is generic. And I think I implemented one such a thing. Let's say Adam Bean generic DAO, and I only implemented a generic CRUD service. This was almost 10 years ago. 
And uh, this is like one control, so forget the local, it was uh, 10 years ago, there was a, don't think there was CDI. And um, so it is just a generic uh, DAO which can be invoked from outside and, um, and it can handle whatever entities you like. So, and if this is not enough, then just go with Delta Spike, for instance. So this could be, of course, you don't need the local interface here. This was in old times. And why I did it? Because back then it was impossible to enter a project without a DAO. Everyone loved the DAOs. So what I did, I implemented this and deleted afterwards. This was my personal trick. And I think, and I think, uh, I wrote it somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's sometimes easier to deploy some superfluous code just to avoid more expensive discussion. And this was 10 years ago. <laughs> so we were young. So next one. How would how how would be the best way to handle partial updates via patch on Jaxer's resource, assuming that the client doesn't want to implement JSON patch spec? So uh, so what I understand from that is you would like to use HTTP patch without using JSON patch. Specifically, how can I determine whether the client sends null explicitly in a field or when it's omitting a field? So with JaxOS, it's an easy answer because JaxOS is not a remote procedure call. So it's not like you are sending a JSON patch and the server or a JSON object and the server has to find out what to do with it. Rather than a JaxOS resource is hopefully somehow um, business oriented. So uh, let's say I have, let's say, a workshops resource and I would like to update the description of my workshop, of a single workshop. So it's not like I will send all my workshops and one field will lag. So rather than I would do something like workshops, effective web app slash, and then let's see, are, is this description, you know, a, 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 a part of the business API, then I would go with workshop slash effective web app slash descriptions and add the description or remove a description. And this is easier to know what to do with the data because, you know, um, then it is b because uh, you have already the context that uh, someone sends you a description and now you can say, okay, a description will over always override the uh, common description or not. So this is what, uh, what I will do. I will try to keep it simple and use the context to find out what to do. What I wouldn't like to do is to implement my own patch protocol on top of JSON just because my client don't like to, uh, to use JSON patch. Okay, so this would be my answer. And of course, there are lots of, uh, lots of uh, uh, generic frameworks which are doing this. One of the oldest is Eclipse EMF framework, which even had uh, generic DAOs or DAOs, data transfer objects. Okay, 19, year, uh, 19 years ago, 19 days ago. Next question. Um, so we had this. So an application for a large population. So the question is what it means. What is large population? Billions, millions, thousands. Have to be efficient. I want to know the maximum operation per second in parallel my application could handle and the number of maximum users in parallel. How I can perform a test like this? I'm using Payara. For instance, with JMH, this is what I uh, like to use it. This is Java Micro Harness uh, Benchmark Framework. This is an OpenJDK uh, project. OpenJDK JMH. This is the name of the project, OpenJDK JMH. And this is a nice project. I even used that, I think, in the microservice workshop, microservices workshop, um, online workshop as well. And what it does is, this is like a Maven plugin which creates an executable jar which um, uh, where you can you have to implement some uh, uh, stress tests and use annotations to, to to say I would like to have a throughput test or a peak test or whatever. And what I what I did in the past I used JaxOS uh, client and 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 wrapped the JaxOS client with JMH and we had a nice stress tests. Okay. Okay. So I have never used WebC or JBoss AS. Yeah. Uh, oh, if, if you have to use, just use Open Liberty. Don't use the large web sphere. Is there really a great difference between this application service and free ones like Payara, Open Liberty, or Whitefly? Great. Uh, this is a great difference. I would say 
except WebSphere and, uh, between WebSphere and Open Liberty, there is a great difference between, be, because uh, WebSphere is huge and Open Li Liberty is tiny and extremely fast. But there is, an, uh, I would say, JBoss AS and Whitefly. So how it works usually is, um, so uh, the Whitefly is the open source version. So you get immediately the releases released every three months. And JBoss AS is um, released uh, less often, but uh, it comes, uh, it is um, supported by Red Hat. And uh, if you have a large project, usually clients buy JBoss AS in order to get support. In the case of Payara and Glassfish, it's like Glassfish is um, more or less abundant and Payara is like the, uh, not only, it's the open source versions where you can buy commercial support. And so I would say, um, the question is rather, if you are building an application for a large population and this application is in production, in one point of time you have to decide, do you have money or do you have time? If you have a time, you will have, you know, to dig into open source code and, and, and problems, try to find, you know, glassfish bugs. And um, if you have money um, and uh, if you are building a serious application for a large population, I think you have to have money. Then I will rather buy support and let, for instance, the Payara, IBM, Open Liberty guys or, or Red Hat guys uh, or guys uh, or girls, um, the extremely skilled developers who actually um, have commit rights to, to build the servers to fix the errors for you. So this is a business decision, I would say. So Avdu says, I have recently bought your online workshops, Bootstracks and Effective Java E. Thank you for that. So and now he's... Uh, she or he is uh, is going through the bootstrap section. I saw that you never mentioned servlets, and why not? Um, because servlets, um, actually, if I mention JaxOS, I indirectly mention servlets. So um, what for me, what JaxOS is, is like, um, or what usually happens, and uh, or JaxOS doesn't have to be implemented with servlets. But in the case of Jersey, it was. At the very beginning of Jersey, there was, was a Jersey servlet. And what it did is it scanned Jaxorus resources, tried to, tried to found a, uh, find a uh, path, get, post, and so forth annotations. And, um, and it was like a translator between um, HTTP protocol and Jaxorus, Jaxorus annotations. So um, servlet is lower level than Jaxorus. So therefore, I would always use JaxOS if the performance is good enough, and usually it is. So uh, the, the overhead is just negligible. It's like um, some uh, introspection or uh, yeah, uh, uh, reflection, uh, reflection overhead. And um, I would use servlets if I would have to implement a generic remote procedure call protocol, for instance. And I would use to, uh, JaxOS to, to implement something uh, which is relevant for business. So this is the distinction. Um, should I go for client servlet JaxOS? Um, so no. can you explain how can I make applications that makes use of session? I would say if you don't need HTTP sessions, don't use it. Uh, and it's not the best practice to use session. And um, or other way around, if you need a HTTP session, you can also access HTTP session in JaxRS by injecting the uh, HTTP server request with context, and you can then you have your session. So it's not a problem at all. Um, and or if you could explain a little bit more about how to build a modern web app, yes, that's what you can do. So first, you don't need a state; it's stateless. If a state has to be passed between servlet or servlet. <laughs> Backends and frontend, usually it's something like encoded in JSON Web Token (JWT). Um, and uh, with JaxOS, you are exposing uh, business APIs like, for instance, for Airhex uh, TV, it would be like episode slash. You get all episodes. I would I could say episode slash 56 uploads, and I will um, post an upload to the episodes and get uploads. I, and, and 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 for instance. Um, yeah, this is how it would work with uh, Airhex uh, TV, and um, and uh, so what do you, you are doing? You are exposing a business API via JaxOS. This is what usually happens. And servlets would be like a high performance protocol, or you would like to just have a binary communication between client and uh, and server. Then I would go with servlets. Now, 
Mystify01, 15 days ago, asked me, I have read a little bit about JavaX MVC, perfect. Um, and I really like that. I think Java E missed a framework like this because everybody keeps shouting at Spring MVC when comparing Java E and Spring. Maybe. Uh, I think it was controversial between because we had already JSF and JSF uh, is an MVC framework and then came MVC and there was a la lack of understanding in the community, you know, what is uh, the, the, the point of having uh, Java E MVC if we have JSF. And I think the, the distinction is JSF is more component oriented and MVC is more action oriented. So this would this is the distinction. But I'm somehow confused with it. Yeah, yeah, of course. It says a spec that is built using JaxRS, which is true, is extension of JaxRS. And if and if you start a MVC project, you need to configure and extend application, just as a JaxRS app. Can I use JaxRS resource in the same project with MVC? I never did it, but I think it's possible because what I did is I exposed several uh, several applications or yeah uh, several context paths with JaxRS. And I think even block about that. Uh, multiple, and let's say application path. Yeah, m multiple Jax RS uh, URIs. And w you see what I did? This is application path one, application path two. And there's first and second. And now I expose two paths. So I assume we can do the same uh, exposing one path with MVC and the other one uh, with uh, Jax RS API. Um, what I mean is, for instance, I yeah, this is what we, uh, what I mean, for instance, is f I configure JaxRS under path API, sure, this was the, this one, so I can make a controller class MVC and another one test resource RESTful, so this is what I showed here. Um, so I'm confused no more, I think, mystify, so now everything is crystal clear. Have you any knowledge about what's going on with this MVC? Is there going to be an update on it is safe to create project from scratch using it so um, let's let's see so we have MVC spec Ozark which is the official github account and let's see the last update was 11 days ago so it seems like it's a pretty safe and if you have any further question I think this is the German Christoph um, Kaltenpot is his name so um, just 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 ping him and say hey man is it safe or not so I think, in general, backend frameworks are less popular than frontend frameworks. And the reason for that is, uh, for instance, a backend framework is hard to have, you know, offline capability because if you have offline, you cannot access the server. And, um, but um, is it safe? Your question is, how long is going to be maintained? Um, this is actually hard to tell. And, and for me, the question is, what can go wrong? And if it goes wrong, could I ha could I fix the problem by myself? Let's say, I would say in Java MVC, I think the code is, is easier to understand than let's say JavaScript transpiler or something like this. So I guess the risk is lower. The question is why you need MVC and what you would like to build with it. Because um, if I need a server-side rendering, what I usually use, I use, uh, for instance, JSPs uh, for pre-rendering stuff without the servlet, and this works just great. So, so I would say it is safe to use it, but you have to have a reason to use it, not just for fun. Okay. So, very similar questions so for other reasons. Ro um, Roman KMQ asked me, what do you think which is better? Which is better, faster, and more modern for today web apps? Sublets and JSPs, JSF, or Vadin? So, um, Vadin is great. They have uh, great components, and you can actually use Vadin components as web components without any Java E backend. So, JSF is also modern with prime faces, for instance. And what means modern? I would say modern would be something like Elm framework. This is modern, like, uh, you know, uh, Elm. JavaScript. So, a delightful language for reliable web apps. This is a modern, this is like a transpiler. It's a fully functional framework for in front end. Is it modern? Is it great? Yes, as a controversial, yes, of course. And the question is, what do you would like to build with it? So, this would be one, should be very modern. Um, I would say 
is it productive? So I would because productivity and and maintainability for me this is only thing which counts. And I would say Vadin is productive, GSF is extremely productive, servlets and GSPs without just servlets and GSPs are not that productive as for instance prime faces. Um, for instance, in prime faces you can just there is an and it was ready to use grid. The same is true for Vadin. And with servlets and GSPs you will have to build your grid or table from scratch, which it's really hard because I know, or I assume, the Vadin and Prime Vases guys, they spend several months or even years to optimize tables. So, um, and can you tell me if there are any other good frameworks? So the good news, I try to delete web frameworks as well, at least in the front end. So what I use usually, I, uh, I use web components with web standards. And, um, uh, and if, let's say, we need some uh, some um, domain-specific components like charts. I, I I use D3GS. What I also used in the recent um, uh, web standards of, uh, online workshop. So um, web standards training, web app training dot, um, uh, workshop, and. Um, and um, if I need, for instance, tables or, or, or trees or something more complex, I would go for Vadin or Prime Faces components that are also available as, as web components. I would say just uh, get rid of the frameworks and if you need a more sophisticated component, just use this component as a domain-specific component. You don't need any infrastructure or framework. Okay, next one. How do I handle concurrency in JPA with adversion? So what adversion is, if you can explain a little bit. So adversion, if you put adversion on an entity, um, uh, what happens is on each update uh, of the entity with the same ID, the version is increased uh, or changed. It doesn't have to be increased, it can be timestamped, so it just changes. And, uh, and the idea is you will transfer the version to the client and um, so you have one client with version one, another client with version one. So the first client will update, let's say, my workshop. And then uh, in the table, you will see um, episode uh, ID one, uh, version two, because it was updated. So and the second client will try also to update my workshop and it will fail because the, the, the versions do not match. So and, um, and what you can solve with that are lost updates, and they are similar to merge conflicts and Git or subversion. I saw some discussion that even use GMSQ, and is this GMSQ good to go to, to handle concurrency? Um, first, um, I will release an interesting podcast episode soon, also about concurrency and also about consistency, so um, stay tuned. Next is, um, so GMSQ do not, do not do not solve the concurrency problem at all because you can put whatever you like in the queue, but on the other side of the queue, if you have, for instance, message-driven bean in, um, with multiple instances, you get multiple threads again, which uh, threads again, which will, uh, and you have still the concurrent problem, right? So what you can solve with the queue is uh, like um, offline problem. So when it, one application is not always online, you can put stuff in the queue and the and the and the queue provider will try to deliver the message. So something like this. So you can solve, I would say, business cases with GMSQ not concurrency. And actually, there is no problem. You cannot solve concurrency or consistency problem as a developer. You you should look at this from the business perspective. And from the business perspective means, if several users they are concurrently access, accessing the same table, and uh, and the data becomes inconsistent, something is wrong properly in the process, or uh, you will have to change you know, the business logic or something has to happen. Um, this is the same as you would say you know, one airplane and uh, several millions of, of passengers will try you know, to, to, uh, to access the airplane, so they, you will need some business resolution. Le like, let's say, let's say uh, you know, the uh, passengers with the highest status will be re um, um, that they, they will get another ticket or something like this. So you need a business resolution of the problem. You cannot solve it from a development perspective. With JPA provider, do you use Hibernate or Eclipse Link? I use both, actually. I use a lot Hibernate. I also use Eclipse Link. In some projects, developers really loved uh, Eclipse Link because uh, they liked, um, I was told, the error messages are nicer. And um, I think Hibernate is more popular. So this is what uh, my, my and, and you cannot, you know, for instance, um, 
Hibernate comes with really nice integration with InfiniSpan, for instance. So, um, and if you have already Whitefly, you are using Hibernate. In a project is uh, uh, ships with Payara or, or or Tommy, they are usually using Eclipse Link. So this is not like um, I'm. I'm 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 starting with Payara and then I say okay would I like to replace you know Eclipse Link with Hibernate it never happened in my project so if we go in production with Payara we are using Eclipse Link and if we if we go in production with Whiteflower or JBoss even um, uh, um, EAP then um, we go with Hibernate and by the way there's also a point for the commercial support uh, for the uh, for the um, commercial uh, software vendor, like for instance Red Hat in case of Whitefly uh, and JBoss, I think uh, for them it's a harder to provide you with support if you would use JBoss EAP with Eclipse Link. Okay, how to optimize Java E with only JDBC? So only JDBC means uh, no JPA, they're using result sets and uh, connections. For instance, I have on something DAO and I would say if you just have JDBC is a good idea to use DAOs. Something DAO, and in the class I have all connection class. I have all connection class. I think a connection class methods that do insert, deletes, updates, and or work with a database. Okay. Should I inject that class in EGB? No, you should inject data source with add resource data source, and then the, you, you call data source get connection. And at the end you say connection.close, and the connection is going to be returned to a connection pool. How would EGB transaction deal with it? It will work. If I'm using data source, we just work out of the box. Um, and do you think that it's going to be a good call, JDBC over JPA? Yeah, let's say in case I have to, to, to talk a lot with stored procedures, I would prefer JDBC over JPA. So um, it, just take a look at the code. If the code is clean and simple, go with JDBC. If the, if the code uh, looks a little bit complicated or convoluted, just go with JPA. I mean, if you want full control over code because these frameworks have added so much features that maybe something is not necessary. This is always the case. So um, you cannot always use all features. It doesn't mean I don't need to know from, from 90 features, I only need 10 and therefore I'm not using the framework at all because I didn't use 80 features. And, uh, and there was an, uh, at least uh, a story with Eric Gamma was the... Uh, was uh, the creator of the Gang of War patents. And as I remember, there was someone, a story like um, he told about the Gang of War patents and someone st uh, uh, stood up and asked uh, and said, hey, Eric, I used all your patents in, uh, in my project. And Eric says like, really, all at once, you are crazy. <laughs> Something like this. And, um, and this is also my belief. So uh, I would say frameworks come with a trade-off and the trade-off is, uh, is uh, let's say performance trade-off sometimes um, or, um, or, or size. But um, if you are happy with the size and performance or if you have an application server and the application server comes with JPA, just use it, even if you don't use all the features. So next one, and this is from Varianti2, pro probably from Italy, I would say. I'm building a web app using Java E and idea is based mainly to schedule some tasks then my app offer from different users. For instance, user select what to schedule and after button click, I want to perform some database operation and call singleton methods for scheduling. How would be the best solution if you have thousands to, to tens of thousands of users? Yeah, I mean, thousands of users is not a problem. The, the, the only the question is how many transactions per second you have. So this is interesting. Should you use only one singleton? Uh, if you use at singleton at javax.ejb.singleton, um, what will happen? The singleton will lock. There will be only one thread at a time which is allowed to access that singleton. Um, if you do concurrency management bean, then you can have as many threads as, as, as you like. Would it be efficient, fast? So, um, yeah, but um, in the first place, why you have singleton not stateless? This is often good enough. And um, and for database operation, like insert the data of scheduled task into user history, is a good idea to do this asynchronously? Um, so first, it is not a good idea to do it asynchronously at first because asynchronously means there is a thread pool or a queue 
and you have to configure this. So what I will do first is just put at stateless without any singletons, without any asynchronous be behavior, measure the performance and see whether, whether it is fast enough. If it is, job done. If it isn't, then you can optimize the performance. This would be my advice. If you can tell me the best way to do this, yeah, write simple code and measure. And then you will see whether it is fast enough and you will be surprised how, how, how fast application servers really are. And if you encounter a problem, the problem is usu will usually be your database operation and not the performance from application server. So this is usually means in my projects is always the case. So uh, after you ask me, what are your thoughts on Java 9 and 10? Do you use them in projects? Um, I'm, I mainly rely on Java 8 features. What I, what I uh, like is the, the VARS thing because I use lots of uh, JavaScript. But I, I, easier would be to have let in Java, not VAR, but uh, now it's over. And, um, and uh, I think the structuring will also come to Java, so it will be also nice. But as I would say Java 8 is already good enough, like Java 7 is already good enough, so I'm really happy. And uh, with the fa fast pace, you will see what happens now with the Oracle and commercial version. So let's see what happens at Code 1 conference, which is around the corner. And by the way, I will uh, be a Monday at the conference. I will speak three times on Monday and then fly back because of the uh, project load, I would say. So uh, it was like crazy. Yeah. So lots of Java e requests and Java e projects waiting for me. So I would just spend uh, two days in San Francisco and then fly back. So, but let's, um, after the after the conference, I will, uh, as always, do a special edition or the next edition of uh, AHEX TV, and I will try to record something for you as well, um, as I did last year. So, and can you make a quick tutorial to uh, to put it on YouTube, securing JaxOS with OAuth on Java 8? I thought about that, but I don't think a quick tutorial is uh, good enough. So, if I will do something on YouTube, I will probably record the, the whole. Uh, a, a new workshop, but I will I will have to find some time. It's like crazy times right now, end of year conference season, and uh, all clients would like to have to a project done. Okay, Guru Kulkani asked me seven days ago. Hello, Adam. I know you have used MicroProfile with Payara, and was wondering if you use MicroProfile co config. Yes, I use a lot of MicroProfile config. So I can load properties from within the war from MetaInf MicroProfile config properties, which I never did, because if you put properties inside the war, the question is what the what the point of the properties. You can evenly good, you know, if, even well and just hard code them in source code. If I use MicroProfile config, I always relied on system env, um, env entries or system properties. Yeah, from uh, outside the war, this is what I did. Uh, most of my project are Docker or Kubernetes, and then they 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 pull the config from from environment entries. Yeah, further try to to mount a properties file over to meta inf microprofile config config properties inside the deploy folder. Ah, you, the question is, if you have Docker or something, just you know read the properties from env entries. Don't try to read it from outside, and. If you don't have Docker or Kubernetes, what I did, for instance, with Payara, you can specify the uh, properties with ESAdmin commands, so you can have them completely outside. So either specify the properties in Whitefly, Payara, and Open Liberty on the application server configuration side, so there is no file, it's just key value pairs, and then the micro profile will, uh, the algorithm is, it searches first in, in um, environment and falls back to system properties. So this is what I will advise. Okay, the Atman. Hi, Adam. Nice to see you. So I met uh, the Atman last year at Java One, and I hope I will meet him again this year at Code One for a coffee. So, do you know any functionality in Java to attach a specific HTTP thread pool to a specific context path or EJBs? Of course, if you have Payara, you can specify HTTP listeners and then uh, specify an HTTP thread pool, and this is what you ask for. And um, this is exactly what happens with 4848, like as AS admin, like the administration context runs in different thread pool than, uh, than the remaining part of application server. And therefore, you know, the 4848 is always responsive. We have our Payara 5, great, in a Docker environment. Our health check is a REST service called by Docker health check functionality. Ex exactly, what you're describing here is exactly what I, what I said to you. Do this with uh, HTTP listeners, I think uh, is the name. 
and um, and this is exactly what happens with 48 and 48 and the ad admin. So, second question. How can a Java e REST service which uses JPA and EGB for communication with DB return immediately with an error status code 503? It cannot. If the connection blocks, it blocks. Um, what you could do, you could use um, an, an JAX or a service which is void with add suspended async response and set timeout for the client to say, I'm, I'm blocking just for one second and if the connection is not available, I'll just you know cut the uh, the connection to client, but but the database connection will will block forever because there's no way in Java you know to stop a threat. What you usually like to do is um, if you have Payara and you have it, you can specify health checks on the on connection pool level. This is nothing new. It is for ages. I think in Glassfish v1 already had the functionality. So and, and what the connection pools does, it verifies whether the connections are alive. And if they aren't, they are renewed or just uh, they are not available. So this is what you could do. So you could use the data source or the connection pool's capabilities to verify whether your connection is alive. Okay, now, usually to tend, so um, no, no hair check, ask me. Not sure if you got my question on Twitter. I'm also not sure, so let's see. Usually you tend to work with in-memory models in your demos. Ah, uh, really? I don't know. I'm interested if you could show us some examples how you typically handle database operations via JPA. Okay. What best practices do you recommend for seeding, bootstrapping database and models? Do you prefer Flyway? Yes, this is what I prefer. Or Liquibase? No, uh, Liquibase uh, is, uh, provides additional magic and Liquibase is simpler and straightforward. With Liquibase, you would be ev even able to abstract the uh, database uh, schema into a, a domain-specific language, which I don't need, so therefore I use Flyway. I'm mainly interested in your approach since you are an active advocate for the platform. I'm hoping for a demo. Ha! Huh. Demo? Uh, actually, all my projects are using FlywayDB, and what we are doing, we have FlywayDB migration script uh, sitting on, on Jenkins, and, and, and it, it runs before the war is deployed. And in some projects, we have uh, startup sing singletons, which maintains uh, FlywayDB. The only problem with startup singletons is, of course, if you have cluster-like uh, or redundant HA, let's say not cluster, HA microservice uh, architecture behind a load balancer, because then uh, could be that your database is going to be migrated several times. So um, I would prefer Jenkins for it. Um, okay. And I did it uh, several times on uh, my workshops in Munich, but it was trivial, so I stopped doing that. And by the way, there's also another trick. Um, with Hibernate and Eclipse Link, what you can do, um, Eclipse Link and Hibernate are able to migrate the database schema for you. It's not perfect, but what you can also do, you can say, I don't like to 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 actually maintain the schema database schema uh, for me. What you should do is just to output the uh, the schema changes into a file, and then you get then you get the create and uh, update DDLs, which can be used as a, a starting point. So this is what I also did frequently. Okay, so Tonda, ask me. Ah, there are even nice pictures sometimes. So. Tonda asked me, Tonda100, uh, thank you for doing a hex TV. So thank you for watching. Java E8 in Chick and Chicksaw, is it possible? This is one, a day ago, so we are we are going, you know, we are closer to the end. So Java E8 and Chicksaw, is it possible to develop web application with new 9, 10, and 11? Java, is there an example of or do I have to wait for Jakarta e release? I don't think Java E8, the combination of Java E8 and Chicksaw is is useful because I structure my projects with war. So war is like a microservice, the smallest possible module. It's really tiny, and I don't think it makes any sense, you know, to have to to introduce uh, sub modules inside a war. By the way, funny funny story, a true story. A few weeks or months ago, I don't even remember what it was. This summer, a uh, client asked me to to perform code review for two or three microservices. And they were wars, and they asked me, okay, can I do it? So, okay, how long will it take? To, I say, okay, about two weeks. And, um, and uh, yeah, and then I asked, you know, uh, to, uh, for more time and for more time. And why? Because the developers, uh, I don't know why, but they, 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 there was one war 
but each of the war was about 40 Maven projects. So each of the war comprised 40 Maven projects. So I had to review 120 jar modules in Maven plus three wars, and it took forever. It's like uh, I had to review three three wars, but actually <laughs> I reviewed you know 123 modules. And, and the problem was, you know, lots of the modules, they were just, uh, they, they, they were pointless. This was, uh, there was empty modules just for fun. So, um, and I'm a little bit afraid if someone will find out that Jigsaw could be used, this would be beginning of the end. So, last episode, there was a question about local date serialization for JaxOS and JSON B. The proposed solution was JSON configurator class. But using ECB design pattern, where should I place the class in root? I would leave in project root, exactly, but sometimes there's more of them. Would you create JSONB package or serialization or leave it in root? I would leave it in root, and if there are no, um, you have lots of such configuration files, I would say your project is probably too big. So there is, um, then introduce another war, or, or, or take a look at this, and then you can do something about this. But if you have, but if you get, let's say, three JSONB configuration files, I think it's still okay. Now, 21 hours ago, the question is, so first, so this is what I read carefully because I reviewed the project. And um, on the same topic, how relevant is your video a note on Java testing? Very relevant. It could be a little bit enhanced, but still relevant. Now, about this. So what I have, I have somewhere here the project. I checked it out. So first feedback. Java control, of course, just control. This should be not control rather than boundary, but I know what you have here. Employee, it doesn't matter here. The only thing which matters is this, and you would like to test this class. So action executor with two injected company manager and employee manager controls. I think this would be boundary. This would be controls. Employee, get empl um, employee manager, get employees, and company manager, get companies. By the way, don't call everything manager in your projects because, yeah, it's too easy. And then... The only logic you have here, and this can be unit tested, if they um, if they are uh, not uh, if employees do not contain employee and companies do not contain company, do something. So and you would like to test that. At least it seems like. So the question is how to test it, and the answer is trivial. So I, I don't like to code it because what you what I would do is I would just instantiate the two two company managers with new mock out. Let's say where is it? mock out the get employees and get companies and then with the mocked out contents you can absolute test the inside so you don't need to know Archelia nothing it's just a uh, very basic unit test it would be like the uh, new exec new action executor then i will two news then i will use uh, of course you will need mokito for that and by the way you have already mokito here what you don't have is junit so i will add junit and mokito and uh, yeah then you are ready to go. And um, if you're interested, just go to the online workshop testing or go to the GitHub. Um, and um, so I actually did it. So I would say it's simple. Okay. So um, I would I would like to skip this because this this is really easy to test. It's just a regular POJO test. The uh, just forget stateless inject and inject, and then you could very easily test it. Okay. Now next one. Another question, if you have time. So I have no, no time, but let's do it. Java 8 added SSE in JaxOS. SSE event resources, reconnection support, which tries to resend all missed events, but says it is not reliable. This is true. If I want to make sure that all events were sent, and if not, to send those that weren't, how would you recommend to do that? Um, then you have to look at the distributed protocols or, or just take a look at J groups, for instance, which is a great, uh, um, uh, I would say, foundation for, let's, for InfiniSpan, so J groups. And um, what you will have to do is you will, you will have, you know, to send notification back, I received that, or you can take a look at TCP IP or something like this. So the one service is sending and the, uh, the other has to send receipts and say, okay, I got it, I got it and got it. And, and but this, you, you add, you know, a lot of complexity so um, again I would like to so how I would like to solve such problems I would like to, to think you know what you are actually sending what does it mean from the business perspective or, or, or business logic perspective and say okay uh, let's say they are I don't know you know theater tickets or whatever or, or, or stocks stocks that don't make any sense so just 
you know, take a look what it actually is and what happens if it does not arrive. And uh, then you can re-ask and resend, but you will need a kind of negotiation, which can be very complex. So, um, Jerry DK asked me, what about thoughts on Java 9? And um, the uh, NAS one is going to be deprecated, which is not a big bill, big deal, because what we get is Graal VM with our great support for JavaScript. And I think that Graal is going to be reintegrated in Java 12 or whatever. This would be the best possible news, I hope. Now, Franden, eight hours ago. So what are you doing? You're, you're just, you know, uh, playing the whole summer with Java E. This is like crazy what happens right now. Or you had vacations and, you know, I think, you know, um, the uh, developers like to hack on vacations, you know, Java E. And there after the vacation, lots of questions. So I have a question about your recent post. What is the dependent scope? Uh, also interesting. So I performed some code reviews and developer just put dependent on the classes and asked them why and no, no one knew why. So it's like uh, a new trend, you know, dependent annotations, just put it on a class and see what happens. So and say, so, okay, why they are doing this and try to investigate a little bit. And I... What I think why you see a lot of dependent on classes is because um, developers sometimes forget forget the bins XML, and if you forget the bins XML, only annot annotated classes are injected, and then they are using a dependent on a named or whatever just to find an annotation which is meaningless just to have the dependency injection. This is, I think what happens. Okay, now, in an SCB application, the boundary is annotated with stateless, and all other control instances are uh, as vanilla poachers without any annotations. They are dependent objects. Yes. So now, this would mean that the complete web application would have the same scope like the stateless bean, and because the EGBs are pooled resources, all injected CDI beans would be injected as created only once per EGB. This is true. This approach can lead to unexpected behavior if you use CDI, for instance, variable injection, because they will not re-inject it in this case. Absolutely true. So this injected instances I would expect to be cached. This is my expectation because because we have a pulled instance and pull instance means per instance this is injected only once. In such case, poll interval or poll URL are injected only once per EGB created. Yes. If the configurations change afterwards, already created EGBs will still use the old values. Absolutely true. To avoid such side, side effects, all our beans are either annotated with request scoped, especially on boundary package, or inject objects with getter to retrieve current state. Yes, inject object with getters. This would be, I think, uh, better. So I would just use that if the cached values are okay. And if you have dynamic values, I would just insp uh, would um, inject an instance of integer or the whole configuration object and then, then fetch the configuration with get. And by the way, uh, I would say, is it really the first question is, um, do you have a process how to change the configuration values in production? So in the, I was in many projects where they try to have everything flexible and configured at runtime, and there was actually no process to change anything in production. So I will ask the question first. Is it how you will do it? If there's an answer, just do it. Shagai. So, uh, hello, Adam. A big thanks to this awesome gift Oh man, this is uh, this is not a gift. I'm just you know talking because I like Java E. So, but thank you for watching. Please, in trying to deal with the concerns of multiple integration, are ESBs the way to go in an enterprise environment? I would say enterprise service bus. Uh, um, so, this is a very political topic. So, what I would say is, uh, it is hard to find a project where developers are happy with ESBs, and um, I always ask you know how many how many time, money, or budget a ESB saved? And usually there is no answer or a negative answer. So I would say if you're starting with a project um, and you would like to use ESB, it should be extremely obvious and everyone in the project should know why the decision was made. So it should be obvious. We need the ESB, be absolutely everyone is for it because let's say the ESB saves time or, or, or money or whatever. And this is usually not the case. So it's like, one architect decides to use ESB and no one knows why in some cases, okay? So I, I wouldn't like to, I wouldn't, you know, look at ESB first. Okay. 
Hooks and Dupsl. This is uh, the nicest name so far, I would say. <laughs> Short question about CDI EJB coexistence inside JE. Not nicest. The most interesting name, I would say. Over the last specification of Java E CDI became more and more powerful. Yeah, sure, they are more powerful than EGBs. Nowadays, you even have the transaction handling on board. Yes, from uh, a transactional from JTA. So, what do you think about CDI? Is, is it capable of replacing EGBs? Of course, but you will have to put a lot of annotations on it. So, because I'm lazy, I'm just using EGBs at stateless instead of using transactional request scoped, pulled, monitored, and whatever. So, this is the only reason. Would you recommend the use of CDI over EGB so you will not have to handle mixed forms where you have to deal with eventual incompatible context scopes? Or is it worse to stick on EGB to do the job where designed for? So what I do right now is my boundaries are stateless and everything is a POJO and there are never any problems. And there are lots of projects, startups and big projects which do the same. They focus on business logic. There was never a problem. So if you have a problem, just go with CDI plane or with EGB, EGBs and CDI. And um, I would say optimize only if you have a problem. Okay. We did it in, I don't know how long, one hour. So I think the next time we can cover 42 questions, but more than 50 is impossible, <laughs> I would say. Okay. Uh, so we did it. And I think we, all, yeah. And now we have one question from Twitter. Spring security versus Java e security. Uh, yeah, it really depends on your infrastructure. I would say SL375 Soteria is really nice. And MicroProfile JWT is even nice, so I don't miss anything. Yeah. So do you recommend reading books for Java e or learn online tutorial specs official docs? I actually like read bo reading books, so I buy a lot of books and I read them and I enjoy them and I also reading tutorials. So the question is, if you enjoy, read as much as possible, so nothing wrong with reading. And uh, yeah, I would do both. And if you don't have time, then try to read a book and then read some tutorials, so really, but just read, you know. Read all the time is fun, so this is what I would say. And now Bogdan, you KR space game idea. Ask me. So, what do you think about Angular's front end? So, my opinion about front end uh, Angular is like, you know, old school J2E architects and uh, um, supported by OSGI gurus um, were bored with the back end. And now it's like, okay, now let's see what we can do in the front end and, and uh, try to port parts of the old, you know, Web Sphere application server and uh, let's say uh, Sun One application server platform with ESB to web and then called it Angular. <laughs> this is my personal opinion. So, man, in Angular, it's like web frameworks and you have dependency injection, you have create modules, you have to import stuff three times. It is so complex that you actually have you are you are creating uh, viewers and components with command line interface. Um, and uh, by the way, uh, ten years ago, yeah, around ten years ago. We get rid of XDocLet, which was code generator for J2E, and everyone complained that it was slow and uh, if, uh, if the code needs to be generated, something is too complex. And now we have Angular with code generator, and it seems like the new hot stuff. Okay. I think we are done. We are done. So, then, AirHacks.io. See you at least here. And the very new workshop is effective web apps with web standards. I covered a lot of questions asked before. So uh, I think about five hours continuous hacking. So see you here. Or if you have time, come to Munich. We have a winter market and lots of workshops. And if you cannot do it, then see you at the 56th edition of EXTV. And by the way, I will be, I'm going to be one day at DevOps and WJAX in Munich and JCon in Dusseldorf, and uh, Code One, which is uh, actually Java One in San Francisco. So thank you and bye.